Good morning, First Presbyterian Church family. Pastor Dan here, welcoming you to the live stream service here in the sanctuary at First Presbyterian. Uh, the rain outside, which was a surprise, uh, has forced us indoors to do a live stream for you today. There will not be any courtyard services uh, this morning at 9 a.m. or 10.30. So uh, I encourage you to enjoy this live stream as uh, we have a liturgist, Jeffrey Suggs, and uh, the preacher for the live stream is Pastor Charlie Broxton. Uh, we also will have a sermon online uh, that uh, Pastor Charlie has prepared for you, which I encourage you uh, to watch uh, today. And uh, I want to encourage you all as well to tune in to the Wednesday Word of Encouragement uh, when we are going to uh, have a time of memoriam uh, for the saints uh, of our fellowship who have entered the church triumphant in 2020. And so look for that coming on Wednesday. And I hope that that is a special time for all of us uh, through technology to join together in gratitude for those persons' lives, the impact that God made on all of us through them, and also for us to rejoice in the hope they have and we have in the, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. At this time, I'm going to invite Jeffrey Suggs to lead us in some of the liturgy pieces of this live stream service. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please join me in the call to worship. May a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Please join me in prayer. Lord, we come before you, before your throne of grace, not trusting in ourselves, but in your marvelous and gracious love as it seeks expression among us. May we listen for your still, small voice as it speaks to us today, as it boldly proclaims the undeniable reality of your love that will not let us go. Stir our hearts and our imaginations that we may see beyond appearances of what is to the reality of what can be. In the name and the spirit of the Holy Child, Jesus our Lord, we pray, amen. Please join me in prayer and confession. There are many ways to be unfaithful to what we have become through baptism, to our commitment and our obedience to God. We offer God now our prayers of repentance. We confess to you, living God, our failure to live as brothers and sisters and as your children. We confess to you, loving God, that we have not loved you as you have loved us. We confess to you, gracious God, that we have doubted your word and failed to obey its teaching. We confess to you, merciful God, our desire to own you and contain you within our doctrines and theologies. We confess to you, almighty God, that we do not acknowledge you as Lord of all the earth. Forgive us and redeem us. We have not allowed your presence to shine among us. There are many ways in which we have failed in our commitment and obedience to our fellow men and women. We turn towards our neighbors and our friends and offer them a prayers, our prayers of repentance. Amen. And here is the assurance of pardon the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love.
for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Good morning. Not quite what we expected, but uh, we're still excited to be able to gather, even if it's uh, not in person, but virtually. Um, <clears throat> we met just two days ago, and we talked about how God showed up in the most unlikeliest of places. That he showed up as a baby in a stable, in a, laid in a manger, with shepherds worshiping him. His parents in awe of what God had just done. And what I love today, today's passage, we're looking at Luke 24. It's normally a message spoken around Easter or after Easter. And um, as I was wrestling through it, I started thinking, I'm like, you know, this is the perfect Christmas message. Because what we see in Luke 24 is once again, God showing up in the unlikeliest of places. He shows up on a dirt road with two disciples who are wrestling with all that had just happened after his crucifixion. So before I get going here, I just want to pray, because I'm a little off my game just trying to figure out how to do this. And uh, I, I want to do this passage uh, honor and uh, bring God's word to life. So let's, uh, let's pray. God, thank you um, just for a new opportunity. And for your goodness, uh, I pray for everyone listening, for all of our people. Uh, everyone listening, that you would just give us eyes to see, because that, as we know from this passage, or as we will see, is what is key. You opening our eyes and giving us a far greater hope than anything this world can offer us. So we pray it in, in Jesus' name. Amen. I, growing up as a kid, Christmas time was always my favorite time. Uh, and mainly it was because of presents. It was all selfish reasons. And I think most kids are like that. You wake up on Christmas morning, you go out. And, and part of it was in my family, the love language, and I think it still is, is giving, giving of gifts. And so I love to receive love on Christmas. <laughs> it was all about the gifts. And there was always expectations building up to Christmas. As a kid, you're like, you can't wait, you can't wait, you can't wait, you can't wait. Christmas morning comes. It's a present festival giving and mostly as a kid receiving and getting, getting, getting. And even if all of my expectations for my presence were fulfilled or even exceeded, there was always a letdown Christmas night where it was like, it, it's over. It's done. My expectations were met, but I still ended up sad because it was over. Now, there were other Christmases where I maybe didn't get the thing that I wanted because it was unreasonable. Like maybe it was an elephant or something like that. I don't remember. But I didn't get it. And then my expectations were not met there. And I ended up being sad. And so thinking about Christmas as a child, no matter what, I was always sad at the end of the day. Because even if my expectations were met, there was still a sense of loss because it had come and gone. Regardless, it ultimately didn't meet my expectations. I was unfulfilled. And I know it, it's not just me, and it's not just Christmas. We all struggle with expectations in life and, and having expectations that are unfulfilled. We, as human beings, we're designed to pin our hopes on Jesus. But what we do is, is we pin our hopes on, on other things. We pin our hopes on relationships. We pin our hopes on jobs, on careers, on achievements, on degrees, on a, a, a spouse, on, on our children, on all these other things. And then we end up feeling let down because our expectations eventually somewhere along the way aren't met. And, and we say in ourselves, well, I had hoped that that one would be the thing to bring me that fulfillment. I had hoped. It's a familiar phrase in today's passage because where we come in on the scene in Luke 24, Luke 24, 13, is we come on the scene with two disciples who have left Jerusalem and are traveling seven miles away to a place called Emmaus, and they are disheartened and discouraged 
because they just left Jerusalem where the Passover had happened, and Jesus had been crucified. And their expectations for who Jesus was and what he was supposed to do for the nation of Israel and for them went unfulfilled because he had died on a cross. And so they're walking and they're talking. But here's what I love. It says in 15, as they talked and discussed all these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. So the one that they pinned their hopes on, that they thought was going to bring, and their hopes for the Messiah was less of a dying Messiah on a cross and more of a Messiah who'd come and make their nation number one and bring them forward. He's walking with them, but they have no clue, which is, there's a sense of kind of ironic comedy here. Because the guy that they're talking about, the one that they had pinned their hopes on, that they thought let him down, is right there with them. And Jesus asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Now, Jesus doesn't ask because he doesn't know. He's got, he knows what they're talking about. He is kind of stirring the pot here to get them going. And, and uh, Cleopas, one of them, starts saying, right. he basically tells Jesus, look, are you from another planet? Where have you been? Do you not know what's going on around here? Which is, again, meant to be a little funny. <laughs> it is, because he knows intimately what had gone on. He was the one who was crucified on the cross and now had been raised from the dead, but they didn't realize it. Cleopas says, you have no awareness of these things that have gone on. And Jesus says, what things? Again, he knows he's just stirring the pot. And Cleopas walks down this list, and what we see from the list, he says, you know, he was a prophet, we are talking about Jesus, powerful in word and deed, the chief priests, our rulers, handed him over to be sentenced to death, they crucified him, and then he says this, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And he goes on to talk about how there were some sightings after uh, his, his death, that he'd maybe been raised from the dead, but they're not sure because his words, we had hoped. And we've all been there. We've all been in a place where we can say, we had hoped. We may be able to say this about Jesus. I had hoped that he would heal me. I had hoped that he would heal my marriage. I had hoped that he would provide for me in this way. I, I had hoped. Well, I love how this passage goes on because they don't fully get it right with who they say Jesus is. They don't understand the Messiah. So Jesus says to them this, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I'm going to keep reading here. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. As if. <laughs> I love this. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized. And he disappeared from their sight. All crazy thing when you think about it. He's there. He breaks the bread. Their eyes are open. They go, it's him. And then he's gone. My boy. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Now, here's what I love. Is this transformation of them. When we came on the scene, they're discouraged, they're disheartened, they're saying, we have hoped. We had hoped. We had hoped Jesus was going to do what we wanted him to do. Now, they get up, return back to Jerusalem, because they've got a reason to go now. There, they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them. Uh, how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And they've gone from discouraged, disheartened disciples to genuine, joyful witnesses to who Jesus is and what he's done. Why? Because now they know he didn't just die on a cross. 
He was raised from the dead. And if that can happen, anything can happen. God has come to redeem the world. It just looks different than what they thought initially. That's the problem with the phrase we had hoped. It's my hope, what I want, versus what God is doing. I think back to Christmas, and this is just as true in my life today as an adult. When even all of my expectations are fulfilled, and I get everything that I want, I still end up sad and disheartened. Because my heart, my life, my hopes were never designed to be pinned on anything in this world, ultimately. God created us with a heart that was created, designed to be pinned on Him and His work in and through Jesus. And that is the only thing that brings lasting joy, even in the midst of our struggles. So, my question this morning for all of us, myself included, and I was thinking about this even as I talk, is what are the areas of our lives where we could say, we had hoped? I had hoped this would have been it, the most fulfilling thing in my life. I had hoped God would do this. I had hoped that this would bring me the fulfillment and, and long, you know, all that stuff that I've been longing for. Because what God does here is God, Jesus comes along, he opens the eyes of this, these two disciples, and then after he opens their eyes, all of a sudden, they are given a far greater hope than anything they had ever desired or dreamed of. And that's what God wants to do for us. He wants to open our eyes to see Jesus as he truly is, the resurrected Jesus, and then give us a far greater hope than anything this world could offer. Any Christmas, any gift, any relationship, any job, any achievement, any amount of money or status, anything. And that's where we go here. The pointing of this passage is to Jesus. Because when we pin our hopes on him, we no longer have to say, I have hopes. We can say, I have hope. Even when everything around us may tell us something otherwise. So my prayer for us this morning is going to be that God opens our eyes to see Jesus as he really is. And that he then gives us a far greater hope that lasts anything this world could ever offer. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, that despite you know, the craziness of the rain this morning, you, you're you still present in it. It doesn't, you, you don't go away and run and hide because it's raining. You are everywhere. And you want, I, I think about these two disciples that they say, stay with us. They invite Jesus to stay with them. And God, we do the same. We say, stay with us. Open our eyes. That we may see Jesus as he truly is. Not as we think he should be or as we want him to be, but as he truly is. And God, give us a far greater hope through that opening of the eyes. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That was the message that I needed to hear this morning. So I hope uh, that <laughs> we all are putting that uh, hope in Jesus as Charlie just exhorted us to do. And therefore, that is why we have hope. And that is so cool. Now receive the benediction. May you be strengthened by God's spirit in your inner being. And rooted and established in Christ's love. May you have more and more power with all the saints to grasp how high and wide and deep and far is the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Amen. God bless you.